again, Ethan is uh, back on schedule here and uh, giving those verses. Uh, he is working towards uh, ordination, and uh, we actually had scheduled in December for the quizzing, and I need to just verify with all the preachers we can get back together and do that. And then, Lord willing, we'll have in the beginning of the year uh, a special ordination service. So that's why he's given those verses, do, does that on Sunday nights. And uh, I have, anytime I have somebody that gets ordained, I like to have them memorize scripture because I don't expect these guys to have the answers for everything, but I do know where the answers come from. And it's right from the Word of God. And so if you can get guys grounded in the Word of God to know the scriptures, it is a blessing. It's a real big help. That's the way I was taught. And uh, those are the things I really try to pass on. Well, I'm delighted tonight to be able to have my friend, uh, Danny Whetstone, uh, preach. I had it in my mind to ask him to preach, and I uh, didn't get with him in the beginning of the week. And then I got word on Tuesday that his sister had passed, and I thought, Lord, what do you want me to do now? Should I still ask him? So I prayed about it, and I think either Wednesday or Thursday I called, and I said, Brother, and I said, now you tell me, whatever, whatever you can do, but I'd love for you to preach. He said, I'd be glad to. So I'm, I'm delighted to be able to have you here. I think our first, the first missions conference that I had here at Calvary Baptist would have been in 2017. You were the keynote speaker, and um, I love Danny's preaching. Um, first of all, I just like to hear his voice. He just got that great baritone voice and just, you know, a good radio voice. But uh, more than that, he's a man who loves the scriptures, who loves God, and um, has something to say and something worthwhile listening to. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, introduce the O'Malley's, uh, uh, John and his wife Kim, is that right, Kim O'Malley? And uh, all of them are um, working together with a mission board in North Carolina called Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions. In fact, this morning we prayed for Abraham Uke in Myanmar. Abraham is associated with their uh, mission agency. And uh, so we're grateful for all the work you do. Love you. He's had opportunity to actually be out here and to park out at the, the back building and uh, to be able to visit with his sister uh, before she passed. And uh, so, Danny, why don't you come and just share what God has laid on your heart. Let's give him a round, warm applause, please. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Um, and to have the O'Malley's here with us as well. Uh, Brother O'Malley and I met when we were both missionaries in Grenada, West Indies. And now we've worked together for some 30 years. He serves as president of Worldwide New Testament uh, Baptist Missions. And uh, it has been a joy not only to work together with him, but uh, to have him as a friend. And uh, they came down to spend a few days with us, and uh, I appreciate them so very, very much. Uh, I want to say to you as a church, uh, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, mooch off of you. Uh, I guess you probably know there's no place that you can get uh, anywhere in the area to park an RV. Uh, I called many places and, and tried and couldn't get anything. But actually, this goes back to like last February and March uh, when we came down the first time. Uh, my sister just found that she had cancer and, and they said her time was limited, so we came down and just to spend some time with her. Uh, then she had the surgery and uh, actually, 18 chemo treatments, and then major, major surgery. And then the day after surgery, she got COVID. And then the day after that, she fell and broke her hip. The day after that, they had to do a hip replacement. And I tell you, it just, it just uh, weakened her so. But uh, they were still trying, and she, bless her heart, was still fighting. And uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, her husband, Wayne, took her to the hospital to have some fluid drained off because it, the pressure gets so uh, intense that she can't eat or 
anything, and it's painful. So they went in to get that done, and while she was waiting uh, in the waiting room for them to come get her, uh, her Wayne thought she had uh, fainted. Uh, she actually had died. And uh, they took her around to the emergency room and worked some to try to revive her. Uh, she, she would not have wanted that, but that's, that's what was done. And, uh, of course, she went on home to be with the Lord. And uh, the Lord willing, uh, I'll, I'll have the joy of preaching her funeral on Wednesday afternoon and uh, saying goodbye that final time. But uh, thank you so much for allowing us to park out back. I know the grass needs cut. If those of you who cut the grass, we're in your way. I understand that. But if you'll just give us a few days, the Lord willing, we'll, we'll pull out on Thursday. But it's going to be raining, so I don't know what you're going to do about cutting it then. But <laughs> at least we'll be out of the way. And uh, I want to thank Barry for his kindness uh, to us uh, in the visits that we have made here. And, of course, for the pastor uh, allowing us to be here as well. He was a little uncertain at first because... It was so wet out back, and uh, he thought we would just disappear. Uh, but uh, it has uh, worked out beautifully, and we thank the Lord so much for uh, your kindness. Uh, perhaps you didn't even know we were out there. Perhaps you don't think it's a big deal, but I assure you it is. And uh, we will long remember your kindness uh, to us. If you would turn in your Bibles with me, please, to the book of 2 Timothy in chapter 3. The book of 2 Timothy and chapter 3. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter number 3. Let me read a couple of verses to you that you've already heard this evening, in the uh, last three verses of uh, chapter 3, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Our Lord Jesus walked uh, among his disciples uh, for some three and a half years laboring with them. And uh, then, of course, uh, he was taken to Judgment Hall and on to Calvary, where he hung on Calvary for our uh, redemption. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he got up out of the grave and sealed for us victory forever. Amen. And then, of course, he'll, he'll walk with his disciples again another 40 days and uh, will then meet with them on the Mount of Olives to say goodbye from his earthly journey uh, for the very last time. His disciples will say, are you going to set up the kingdom for Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then he ascended back into heaven. The disciples, they stood there and watched him. I'm, I'm assuming that it was rather gradual, not like a rapture taking place, but rather gradually he ascended into heaven. And Peter and, and John, they're standing there looking along with the others, of course. And maybe after a while, maybe Peter says to John, your eyes are younger than mine, can can you see him? And he said, no, the last I saw of him, his, his feet were enveloped in that cloud right there. And maybe Peter said, yeah, that's the last time I saw him too. How long do you think he'll be? 
And maybe John said, I, I don't really know, but my neck hurts. <laughs> they had no way of knowing whether he was going to come right back or not. And so they're standing there and looking into heaven. And two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. In other words, did he not tell you this was going to happen? Well, surely he did. All you have to do is go back in the scripture and find that he had told them this hour was coming. And did he not tell you what to do when this hour came? And the question again would have to be true. Yes, he did tell them. And so when, when these uh, angels say, say to uh, them, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? You ought to go do what he told you to do. Now that's pretty easy for us to look back a couple of thousand years ago, isn't it? And say, what in the world are these guys thinking? They spent all of this time with our Lord and he told them uh, what they needed to do and, and what he was going to do. And, and now he's ascended up into heaven. It's time for them to go and get busy for the Lord. Might I say we are as hard to get through to as they were? Maybe he would not say to us, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? He might say to us, why stand ye gazing at the headlines? Did he not tell you it was coming to this? This know also, in the earlier part of the chapter, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Did he not tell you it was coming to this? And did he not tell us what to do? When it did come to this, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. It is our duty before God to evangelize this world. We cannot save this world, but we certainly can evangelize this world. It is only in God's power to save, but we can introduce the sinner to the Savior that has the power to redeem them from their sins and give them a place with us in heaven one glad day. Well, now the disciples, they go on to Jerusalem and of course they pray. They don't know how long they're going to be praying. Turns out it was 10 days and then the day of Pentecost was fully come. Oh my, Simon Peter is going to preach. 3,000 people will get saved. You say, well, what stone... What do you think he means by 3,000? I, I think he means 3,000. Yeah. You know how many out of the 3,000 that got saved got baptized? 3,000. You know how many of the 3,000 that got saved and baptized, how many of them continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers? 3,000. I'm going to tell you. If God saves your never dying soul, they won't have to get a posse together to go find you and get drag you in church. You'll want to be here. There will be something about this crowd that will draw you. There will be something about this place that will draw you. There will be something about this word that will draw you if you truly get saved by the grace of God. So the church, of course, is going to start moving forward. Many wonderful things are going to happen. Among those, Saul of Tarsus is going to get saved and become the Apostle Paul. And uh, the, church, the church doubts it. They didn't trust him. They said, he's pretending so he can find out where we're meeting and he's going to come destroy us as he has others. But Barnabas believed him and embraced him, took him to Antioch and uh, had him serve with them. And then... When the first two missionaries are called out of the church that was in Antioch, 
it was Saul and, and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul at that time. And on this first missionary journey that they go on, it'll become Paul and, and Barnabas uh, from then on. He'll make three major missionary journeys, and I think a fourth one actually as a prisoner to Rome. And then in Rome, he will be under house arrest for a couple of years where he will write four of the epistles, we believe. He will write four of the epistles that we have in our New Testament. And then he's going to be released for a while. Later, he will be arrested again and placed this time probably in the Mamertine prison there in Rome. He is going to be imprisoned. We know that for certain. And now he is writing to Timothy. Timothy, his son in the Lord. Timothy that will by and large take over Paul's ministry. Now there will be others, Titus and others, that will of course have been under the tutelage of, of the Apostle Paul, but he's honed in uh, primarily on uh, this young man named Timothy, and he's writing to him. And I believe he is saying to Timothy, this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous, hard to deal with, savage days he says, are coming. Timothy, I want you to prepare for those days. Because when they come, there's some things that you're going to need to remember that you must do. You see, Paul knew what the tendency would be. It is in all flesh. When we're faced with the kind of difficulties that, it, that these young men following Paul were faced with, now, when he writes to Timothy and, and asks him to come uh, to Rome to see him, that was a big step, that Timothy would come uh, where Nero was ruling and had the power to put him to death and had put many Christians to death and would, in not too long a time, see to it that uh, Paul goes by way of the grave. So he says, Timothy, I want to share some things with you that I think will help you in the last days. Now, you say, Brother Whetstone, do you really believe that we're in the last days? Oh, yeah, we're in the last days. As a matter of fact, I think the last day started when the Lord Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives uh, in, the, in the story in the first part of the book of Acts. And I believe we've been living in the last days ever since. All of the characteristics that I gave to you just a few moments ago have always existed. But we, in our lifetime, have seen them intensify more and more and more. I never dreamed when I was born 30 years ago, <laughs> I never dreamed I'd see a day like this where our Savior is ridiculed and mocked and used as a byword. Never in a million years did I ever dream it. See, when I was a boy, uh, I was born in Tallahassee and grew up in a little fishing town just south of there, Panacea, Florida. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, the worst drunk in town could pass the, uh, on the street by the church, but he'd go to the other side to do it. The worst cusser in town would stop cussing if a woman came around. Now, unfortunately, women are doing most of the cussing. I never dreamed I would ever see a day when a socialist would be accepted in the United States of America. Seems to me we've lost too many lives and shed too much blood to now bring it into our country. But nonetheless, we've never seen days like this. These are uh, difficult, savage, hard to deal with days. But that does not mean that God is finished with us. That does not mean that we can sit by the wayside and say, okay, all right, you can see the, the times and how they are and, 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 and certainly they are, are what uh, Paul uh, said to Timothy are going to come in the last days. We're there. So let's just sit down right here and wait until Jesus gets back. Last thing on this earth our Lord would want us to do. No, he wants us to get busy. So, Timothy, what is it going to take for you to remain faithful in these desperate, difficult, savage days? First of all, 
I think Paul says to him, the word of God. Look with me, if you would, please. Now, uh, again, uh, verse four, number 14 in chapter 3, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The word of God is good for salvation. As a matter of fact, there's nowhere else you're going to find it. It is in, in the word of God. Um, Paul said that it is the gospel, it is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save the soul, Romans 1.16. Isn't it wonderful, and doesn't it take a lot of pressure off of us that we don't have to have the power to see sinners saved? The gospel has the power. What we must do is unleash the word of God and let it go do its work. Don't get anxious. Give the word of God and let it do its perfect work. Years ago, when I was in Bible college, uh, I worked a job from uh, 4.30 in the afternoon till 12.30 at night. And then a group of us would go out to an old campground, uh, not an RV campground, a Bible preaching campground where they had sawdust and flung her down on a regular basis. We would go out there after we would finish working at 12.30 at night and pray until the wee hours of the morning. We were young. We, we had no idea that you were supposed to sleep. In one of those prayer meetings one night, God spoke to my heart about my dad. My dad was lost, and I said to the Lord, Is it going to be that I will see men saved in many places and my own dad die and go to hell? And the Lord spoke to my heart in a very real way, not an audible voice, nothing spooky, but he spoke to my heart. And he let me know that he wanted me to go witness to my dad. Now, I loved my dad, and, and we were quite close. But conversation was not his strong suit. He was a very quiet man. He only said something if he had something to say, and that wasn't often. And I said, Lord, surely you can send somebody to witness. I sent a fellow down, a preacher, to witness to him one time. He went down and talked to him about fishing. Never mentioned Christ or salvation. People didn't witness to my dad because they were convinced he wasn't going to get saved anyway. So as soon as uh, I left that uh, prayer meeting that night, I started making plans and preparations for us to go back uh, to Panacea, and I was going to I was going to see to it that my dad knew for sure how he could be saved by the grace of God, and so. We got there, and Dad and I went out for a ride. We often did that. And I got to a quiet place where I knew no one would bother us. I pulled over side the road, and I said, Dad, I need to talk to you. He said, okay. I said, I want to say some things to you. That's not the easiest thing in the world for me to do, but if you would, just let me finish. He said, you say whatever you got to say, son. And I took him step by step through the plan of salvation. And when I finished, I said, Dad, will you today take Christ to be your Savior? And he said, not today, son. I said, well, I want you to know I'm going to be praying for you. And when that time comes in your life that you do want to be saved, I want you to let me know. And he said, I'll do that. I bought him a Bible. I would leave gospel tracts around the house when we would visit uh, I called him every Saturday, no matter where I was in the world. I called him, and we talked most of the time about nothing but foolishness. But we talked. Sometimes I would get to get a plug in uh, of the gospel. I was pastoring in Greenville, Tennessee. I'd been up the better part of three days and three nights uh, with a fellow that was dying. And it was about 30 miles from uh, our town, 
the hospital, and I was going up to visit him. I was headed back. It was on Wednesday afternoon, and I knew if my assistant pastor had to preach on the spur of the moment, it would scare him to death. But uh, I stopped at a, uh, by a Dairy Queen. They just so happened to have a pay phone. No cell phones, no such thing. Not only did I not have one, nobody else did either. So I stopped at a pay phone and I called my wife to let her know that I'd make it back in time for church and she could, she could let uh, Brother Greg know so he wouldn't be nervous. And she said, I just got a call from your dad and your Aunt Maybelle uh, is not expected to live. Don't know why and, and I certainly don't want to appear spooky to you, but I knew the moment she said it, my dad was going to get saved. And so I went home, preached that night, bought me a ticket out of Knoxville, Tennessee to Tallahassee and flew back to Tallahassee, rented a car, went out to the hospital. And, of course, the family had gathered there at Maybell. She would not last very long. And uh, my, my dad's youngest sister said to me, Danny, take Woodrow down to the chapel and y'all pray for Maybell. Now, she knew my daddy couldn't pray. Uh, he was just being set up. We went down to the chapel, and no lights were on. Some light was coming in through the stained glass window, so it wasn't completely dark. And Dad and I walked down the aisle and got about a half, maybe two-thirds of the way, and I knelt down, and Dad knelt with me. I said, Dad, I don't know anything else to tell you. I'm going to pray for you. And when I finish praying, I'm going to hold my hand out. If you'll take my Savior to be your Savior too, I want you to take and put your hand in mine. And the best way you know how, I want you to ask God to save you. I prayed for a while. I was scared to stop. Finally, I stopped praying. I held my hand out. It seems like it was out there for an eternity, though I'm sure it was only a few moments. And I felt the calloused hand of my 59-year-old dad go into my hand, and I heard my daddy pray for the first time. And he told God he was a sinner and that he wanted to be saved. Dad lived almost 11 years, 71 years of age, he went home to be with the Lord. I preached Daddy's funeral. I said when my earthly father met my heavenly father and my dad became my brother. And what a sweet brother he was to me through those years. God has the power to save. Sometimes we have to give him room to do it. He said it's good for salvation. Then secondly, he said that not only is it good for salvation, but it's profitable. In verse 16, he said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Notice this, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, the Bible will teach us the truth. And then if we uh, go away from that truth, <coughs> uh, it'll reprove us. He said, what in the world are you doing out there? And then it'll correct us and get us back to where we ought to be. And then it will instruct us so that we don't make that mistake again. The Word of God is indeed profitable. And so he says, because it's good for salvation and because it's profitable for our daily lives, he says, I want you to preach it in chapter 4 and verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God... And the Lord Jesus Christ, who, will ju who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Not about the word. Preach the word. He said, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Preach the word. Be instant, he said, Timothy. At any given moment, be ready. I will tell you, I'm not much for instant. I, I would prefer, if, if you're going to make mashed potatoes, get some taters and peel them. 
and boil them until they're nice and soft. And get all the butter you can handle. And salt and pepper. And mix it all up together. You say, but Brother Whetstone, when I do that, they just come out lumpy. I like lumpy. I don't know who the fellow was that invented instant grits. But somebody ought to whoop him <laughs> to desecrate something so precious as grits that will certainly be at the Mary's Supper of the Lamb. <laughs> and everybody's going to like how they taste. Yep. And again, you need a lot of butter and salt and pepper. You do not need any milk or sugar. Amen? So I'm, I'm not for most things that are instant, but instant preaching I'm all for. I tell you, just be ready any moment to fling her down. Be ready at any moment to give an answer of the hope that's in you. He said, be instant in season, out of season. <clears throat> he says, I want you to reprove and rebuke and exhort. As a young preacher, <clears throat> I was pretty good at that. Reproving, rebuking. And every once in a while, I'd even exhort. And one day, I stopped to read the verse carefully enough that I saw with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, one of the, one of the most amazing things, uh, <clears throat> uh, stories, at least in the Scripture to me, is, is Paul dealing with the church at Corinth. He said, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as in the carnal, even as in the babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. That was after he had spent a year and a half trying to teach them. You, you could imagine, he didn't just want to throw his hands up and say, I'm done with you guys. But he didn't. Never did he give up on them. He kept teaching them and he kept preaching to them and he kept trying to help them. And we must do the same. You saw that fellow, he's never going to amount to anything. You don't know that. We can't give up. What if I had given up on that after five years? Or six years? You might have a son or a daughter, a loved one, a friend that you look at and say, he's so ungodly or she's so ungodly. They have no interest in the gospel. They will never get saved. You don't know that. What happens is we become uh, self-fulfilling in our prophecy. We must continue to go with them, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and get them under the sound of the preached word of God. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He talks about the, the Word. Secondly, he challenges Timothy about the work. If you would look in chapter 4 in verse number 5. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. He says, I want you to watch. That is, I want you to be on alert. Do, do you feel like the churches in America today are on alert. I've, I've never seen such a plague of apathy, of unconcern. <clears throat> the preacher that I was called to preach under there in Tallahassee, Florida, I was a diesel mechanic for McKenzie Tank Lines, and going to Maranatha Baptist Church in those days. He used to preach a message entitled, A Dry-Eyed Church in a Hell-Bound World. That was 50 years ago. Oh, more than 50 years ago. I've been preaching 51 years. It was more than 50 years ago that he was preaching that. I will tell you, 50 years ago when he preached that, I don't know that you could preach in any of our churches, Pastor, but that when invitation was given, our altars would be filled and we'd leave tears behind. 
And oftentimes it wasn't because we had great needs in ourselves, but we had loved ones and friends that we were so broken for. I can remember my dear Aunt Dovey in a service one time <clears throat> coming and praying so earnestly that my uncle had to come and take her by the arms and, and help her up and out of the church. She was so moved and broken for someone. Where is it gone? Where has the tenderness and the concern and the brokenness, where has it gone? I'm so fearful that we have lost to a large degree our brokenness over sinners. He said, I want you to watch, be on alert. Then he says, I want you to endure. And I'm not going to take time to go back and read it, but in the previous chapter, the first five verses, he speaks of, uh, to Timothy uh, again there about enduring, that hardships are coming. And they do, don't they? You'll not get through this life without a heartbreak. Oh, no. You'll not get through this lifetime without discouraging moments. However, we don't have to talk about them all the time, do we? Yeah. If you're 70 years old, every complaint you have, everyone else has too. They just don't talk about it. It doesn't help to sit around and when the only difference between us is milligrams. Some has to take a few more, some a few less. Our disposition, I'm convinced, would be so much better if we spent more time praising than complaining. I have it worse than anybody. Oh, no, you hadn't seen everybody. There are some folks going through far more than we ever dreamed of. God has been so good. They told, a surgeon told my nephew uh, about his mom. My sister just passed away. He said, Andy, because of, and I won't describe to you what was going on, but he said, because what is happening, you need to call hospice immediately because this is going to be an extraordinarily painful death. The next day she went to sleep. God's good. Oh, God is merciful. He keeps his eye on his children. And she was able to peacefully make the crossing to her eternal home. So he said, I want you to watch. I want you to endure. He says, I want you to evangelize. Do the work of an evangelist. It is our duty to reach out to a world that is lost and without Jesus Christ. I'm, I agree with the pastor. We ought to go vote. I have already. We ought to vote. But I don't think for one single moment that voting is going to put this world in the place it needs to be. Only seeing sinners saved by the grace of God is going to change what we really see in this world today. It's one sinner at a time. evangelize and then he says in the latter part of verse 5 <clears throat> make full proof of thy ministry he says Timothy don't give up don't quit did any of you by any chance see or remember seeing years ago <clears throat> there was a, a picture that I think went around rather uh, to almost everyone, and it's this crane. Uh, not the kind you're using all over the place here, but the kind that flies. There was a crane, and he was standing in a shallow pond, and uh, uh, things all about him. But he had caught a frog and had it in his mouth. Do you see this? No? 
So the, oh yeah, somebody's thought. So the crane had the frog in his mouth, but the frog had taken his front two, whatever those things are he has, and grabbed the crane around the neck and was choking him. And the caption underneath said, don't ever give up. Far too often we give up far too easily. You remember when the Lord uh, got up out of the grave and in John uh, 21, he uh, went down by the seashore and there his disciples were fishing. They had fished all night and caught nothing. It's a repeat of a story that had happened uh, earlier when he first met them. And so he calls out to them. He said, children, have you any meat? Well, about the last thing you want to ask a fella that's fished all night and caught nothing is, how many do you have? I can imagine Simon Peter's response was not tender. But he let him know that they had fished all night and hadn't caught anything. He said, put your net out on the right side of the boat. They put their net on the right side of the boat and caught a great catch of fishes. They were ready to close up shop and go home. And too many of us quit a boat's width from victory. The fish they were looking for were swimming under the boat right then. Don't give up. Finish out what God has given you to do. And then he gives them not only the word and the work, but the warning. Chapter 4 and uh, beginning in verse number 7, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not unto me only, but, but to them also that love his appearing. Do, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That must have been heartbreaking. Timothy is mentioned among the co-laborers with the Apostle Paul. In Colossians and in Philemon. And now here Paul is, as far as he knows, a few days from death. And Demas forsook him and went back to Thessalonica to live in the world. Now, there were others that had, had followed Paul. They went to places of ministry. But Demas went back to the way of the world. How that must have broken his heart. And I think Paul would like to say to young Timothy, uh, it happened to Demas, don't let it happen to you. Hear me and hear me well. Anything flesh has ever done you're capable of. You say, oh, I'd never do that. I'm going to tell you, I learned long ago that never is a very long time. I would use that word reservingly if I were you. Never is a very long time. So what must we do? Watch. We must be on alert. We must be careful and remain active in the things that would keep us away from the world. Hang around this crowd. Go out and talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus. Read your Bible. If you do not stay true to God on purpose, you will not stay true to God. It will not just happen. It must be on purpose. This know also that in the last days, Perilous times shall come. But thank the Lord, even in spite of the last days, we are victorious. Did you know we won? Huh? You say you mean we're going to win. No, no, we already won. I mean, something, something awful is going to happen to you one of these days. You're going to go to heaven. Yes, you're going to heaven. If you're saved by God's grace, you're going to heaven one of these days. 
Don't get over that. Back again, back when I first started preaching, and Brother Boucher, you could, you could walk into any of our churches and just say, Jesus is coming again. Oh, we'd bail out windows, we'd wave handkerchiefs, we'd shout till we didn't have a voice left. We were pretty excited about it. What do you mean? Because we're going to heaven one of these days. I'm convinced there'd be a lot of Christians today that if the Lord sent a notice and said, I'll be there in three days, they'd say, could you put it off a week? I'm going to Disney. <laughs> you see, we used to love heaven far more when we had far less. May it get precious to us again without the Lord having to rob us, having to send us back to desperate times again, because he's certainly capable of doing that. But I think if he would see his children on alert, uh, enduring hardships, evangelizing, and fulfilling their ministries or the work that God's given them to do, I think the Lord would be pleased to continue to bless us. And he does bless us indeed. I have a preacher friend in North Carolina. If you say to him, preacher, how are you doing? He always says the same thing. It'd be a shame to complain. Are you hearing me? It'd be a shame to complain. And it would be. Because when we complain, we're laying uh, words against our Lord that he hasn't taken all that good care of us. At a fellow tell me one time, he said, Brother Whetstone, I'd love to go into full-time ministry, but I'm afraid I'd starve to death. I said, Brother, everybody I know in full-time ministry is on a diet. About the last thing you're going to do is starve to death. Come on out here with us. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self covetous, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, headed, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Paul wrote the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection. Of course, he starts out with the gospel, as uh, are on these banners. He starts out with the gospel. And then he, he said, if Christ be not risen, you're, you're yet in your sins. But he concludes that he had risen and that we were no longer in our sins. He goes on down, I think it's verse 34, if I'm not mistaken, and, and he says to them oh, that we ought to be ashamed. Why? He said, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. I believe what Paul was saying there <clears throat> was that people are coming into your church that are unsaved and they hear you arguing over things like the resurrection. And they're going away confused. Some have not the knowledge of God. Now, if that was true in that day, it would have been in a very small way when compared to how we argue the Bible on Facebook. Don't let people suck you in to getting into arguments about spiritual things on Facebook. For the most part, they're not trying to do anything sincere to begin with. They're looking for a fuss and a fight, and they sit back and laugh when people get on and start putting nonsense out before the world. And then once he gets past that, he... He, uh, he tells us that indeed Christ did get up out of the grave. 
And he says, because Christ got up out of the grave, one of these days we will too. And then he closed, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we're doing is eternal. Let's stay with it by the grace of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and love to us. Thank you that we have the blessed word of God. Thank you that we have a work yet to do. And help us to heed the warning that as Demas has gone by the wayside, so could we. We should be on alert. We should be involved in evangelism. Help us, I pray, dear Lord, to honor you in all that we do. And I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.